Hello, everybody. Welcome to the latest from our Global Insight series. I'm Mark Clement, and one of the great joys of my work as a broadcaster with BBC Radio and Television and as an event host, including working with the UCFB and the Global Institute of Sport, is I get to hear people's stories. And that's what this series is all about. We've pulled together some leading professionals from the world of football and sport and we ask them quite simply, how did you get to where you are now? And this time around, our guest has a quite magnificent CV. 20 years experience making media content in talent management and also negotiating commercial opportunities. I first met her when she was a reporter and then producer at the BBC. She then worked for an independent production company and for the last six years, Jo Tung has been CEO of Tung Tide Media, a sports agency that she owns specializing in talent management and production. Well, here's the thing. How often do you actually reflect on your own journey, Jo? Um, I try not to because I think then I would put pressure on myself or I would find it a bit overwhelming possibly. I think it's easier just to sometimes keep doing, um, which I wouldn't advise people to do. <laughs> Don't just keep going on the treadmill. But I think if I sit there and think, oh, I run this company and I'm in charge of this and I'm responsible for this, um, it can be quite overwhelming. So I tend to just go, oh yeah, I've had I've had a nice career and I've enjoyed lots of it and I've worked very hard. Full stop. I mean, you seem very serene, but are the moments in your role now that are like just frantic inquiries for clients, productions reaching the sort of crescendo and you get those bottlenecks where it all happens at once and you don't know which way to spin? all the time all the time like the team will tell you i'm the i'm like that all the time i kind of have a moment i go oh this is crazy um but i think like i thrive on those moments because they it's adrenaline rush it's a buzz i i actually perform better when i'm busy um i've always performed better against deadlines you know i originated in live broadcasting so i think actually pressure is something that I work very well under. However, I do have those moments where I just go, whoa, I can't do this, this is too much. But do you have to prioritize as well? Like I'm, you know, I spin a lot of plates, but I need to look a few days in advance so that my preparation doesn't bottleneck. Are you are you sort of similar? You don't mind the, the deadline after deadline, but you need to make sure there's not a big one on the horizon that's gonna really, really cause you maximum stress exactly that so i always work backwards so i'll always um right what's the what's the end point and how long have i got between then even to the point where i i organize my social life around okay so that evening's out so that evening's great because i know i've got that the next day and i'll need two hours because i'll be stressing or i'll be wanting to read something or i'll be wanting to prep that so yeah i'm very much especially on like a saturday or a sunday I'm like, right, what does that week look like? Work backwards. Where's my pressure points? Where's my busy day? Where's my day when I can breathe? Where's my day where I can say yes to a coffee that I might not be able to? Um, so, yeah, it's it's. I totally have to prep all of it. And there is method. To, I always say to people, there's loads of method to my madness. So I may seem a bit here, there, <laughs> but underneath it's all actually quite controlled and prepped. And that's a skill in itself to reach a point of maturity in your working life where you take that stuff in hand because I'm imagining in the early days and we've known each other a long time there might have been some crazy moments where you don't do that and you're sleep deprived and grumpy and not thinking straight and not being creative so it, it, that's work mastery in itself isn't it exactly that so I was just permanently exhausted because I used to work seven days a week because I didn't like saying no to anything I wanted to do everything I freelanced a lot, so I wanted to do extra stuff at weekends. I'd be going to football or events in the in the week, and I honestly was permanently exhausted. And now that's even going back to that prep thing where I, I manage my time. So I'll never do more than two nights in a row where I've got 
a work event because yeah. I don't have the energy for the third night. Yeah. And also, I guess, you know, and UCFB, Global Institute of Sports Students in particular, we know that I'm always going on about this. You're leaving your impression on the world. So if you are stressed and people sense it or you are absolutely knackered, then it's going to be part of the picture that people build of you and the, the tone that you set, Joe. But also just in terms of meetings, like there's no point having a meeting if I haven't prepped it. Because if I don't know what I want to get out of that meeting, I'm just sitting there talking for half an hour. It's a waste of my time and it's a waste of someone else's time. So, yeah, exactly that. Don't, you know, they'll know if I'm exhausted. They'll know if I'm not bringing energy. But generally, you know, if someone's not prepped as well. Yeah. There's, there's no way you would ever not bring energy to a conversation, Joe. <laughs> Tom. Right. I want to take you back because you and our paths intertwined at BBC Radio in the early. 2000s, but mm -hmm. I know your dad is one of your company directors now, and your dad worked for three of the newspapers, worked on a heck of a lot of World Cups, Olympics. Was, did he spark your interest in sport, Joe? Um, I'd actually say possibly my mum did, because oh. my mum's from a more sporty family than my dad. Um, so from whenever we were growing up, my dad was obviously off working because he worked, as you said, in the industry. So my, my dad wasn't around a lot, um, especially at weekends. So it was actually my mum that would be taking us to sport or we'd be watching sport with. And she grew up in a very sporty family. Her, her father was a professional sportsman. So it was just the norm to her that at weekends she had, four, there was four kids. So we laugh about it. Like one of our best days out was the 1991, and I am showing my age here, the 1991 <laughs> semi-final between Spurs and Arsenal. And my dad was working and my mum took all four kids. So two boys, two girls, and we were all under the age of 10. And wow. she took all four of us to the semi-final at Wembley, which was, it was really heated at that time. Obviously the hatred between Spurs and Arsenal is, there was so much build up. I think it was the first time they've been a semi-final played on neutral ground um, at Wembley. And bless her, she just, you know, she just thought it was very normal to take four kids on the tube and off we went to Wembley and this was our standard Saturday out. So, yeah, much as I think my dad's job I found interesting and my dad's passion and around the dinner table, that's all we did speak about as a family because it was our common ground. So we'd, and we were all going to football and all playing sport. Um, so, yeah, in the household, but actually physically taking me to sport or feeling that it was normal it was very normal as I said there was two girls two boys it was very normal that whether you were female or male or whatever you went to football so was 1991 the moment at which you badly let your father down and started to follow Spurs rather than his <laughs> beloved late knowledge it was you know it was it was pre it was prior to that I think I was a bit of a glory hunter in the 80s with <laughs> Oswald Dealies and Glenn Oddle but I blame my in fairness my dad did take me and my brother across to North London a few times to Spurs and we were just sold. Um, so yeah, the, the love started way before the 91 semi-final and then Gaza just sealed it. Yeah, I get it, I get it. So listen, you know, we, we intertwined at Five Live. I remember I was doing a project called the 92 Club where I went to a, uh, a game at every one of the top four division grounds. You were working online at that point, weren't you? You were coordinating, but yep. what, was your, what was your entry point into the, the BBC, and what did you want to be as your working career was setting off? So I think at that point, I just, I think I did want to be a football reporter because at school, I went to a very academic school and I was quite good at English and I wasn't, but the only thing I really knew about was football. So when we were doing all the career options and you were talking about, should I do law or should I do science or should I do geography or should I be a doctor? I just remember sitting there thinking, none of that excites me. I just want to travel the world and watch football and go to football on a Saturday and I'll write about it because that's the skill I do have. So uh, when I graduated, I, I peppered every every broadcaster, every newspaper, every football magazine for work experience. And I ended up getting work on local radio and the local newspaper. So I did that for free for a long, long time while I worked in McDonald's. So, you know, I graduated with a degree and I'm, I was still working in McDonald's, but that's how it was. And I needed to get experience. I didn't have enough experience, so I needed to work for free to get the experience. And were then eventually... Flipping? Were you flipping the burgers? Or no, I was till. I was till. Fine. I talked a lot. Yeah, really? <laughs> I smiled a lot and that. talked a lot. I was good yeah. on till. 
Yeah. Um, and I loved it. I loved it. It was brilliant. And it was it was great to learn how to work properly in a team. And um, I was it was the best job. I did it for years and I loved it. But at the same time, obviously, the rejection pile was growing and growing and growing. And I think it was about a year or a year and a half after I'd graduated. And eventually I got a call from the BBC talent pool who said, we'd like you to come for an interview. We're we're creating a pool of, um, uh, you know, new talent. And I went and because I knew about football, I got put in the sport talent pool and they said, oh, we're starting a new website. So BBC Sport Online had only just started. This is how long ago this was. Yeah. Starting a new website. Five Live's going to have a website. Would you like to write football reports for it? Bingo. Like, oh, it was honestly, it was like all my Christmases had come at once. And I think one, I remember in the second interview, one of the questions was, can you work on New Year's Day? I was like, can I work on New Year's Day? Like the busiest day in football. Of course I can work on New Year's Day. Uh, so I did a double long shift on New Year's Day and um, oh, it was it was amazing. And I was doing match reports. So, you know, really under deadlines, uh, editing audio, but working very closely, as you said, with the radio team. So that's um, how our paths crossed. I mean, one of the subjects I do want to talk to you about is obviously you're very prominent in women in football. So early strike on that one. What kind of reaction were you getting back then? A girl trying to enter the world of football reporting um it was tough especially when i was applying and i remember i went i applied for a very very well-known football magazine that i still love and it was for a football reporter job and i got an interview and i was so because you know you get an interview you think you've well, got the job i mean that you know i'm i'm there i'm in so i remember going up to town up to london for the interview and um i got there and the guy interviewing me said oh i've got you I've got, I've got your CV and I just had to see this woman with her football coaching badge uh, who thought, who thinks she can be a football reporter. And I just, I mean, you'd never say that to somebody then, but I kind of went, yeah, hi, here I am. And I just, it was like I was this novelty where I had to see this woman who on her CV has a coaching badge and wants to be a football reporter. Like as if they was just wheeling me in the office to have a little laugh at and wheeled me out again. And I, I didn't get the job. So I don't know if I was just there to be laughed at or if he genuinely, I don't know. It was just, it was such a strange experience. Um, and then I went to the BBC and I had some great experiences at the BBC, but also some really tough experiences. So I'm quite loud, I was quite bubbly. I like to have a joke around the office and I'd been freelancing as the football secretary. Okay. And there was a certain, um, I don't know, there was a certain way you, you might be treated as the football secretary and not necessarily respected for my football knowledge or the fact I wanted to actually be a football writer and a football reporter. Um, and sometimes I actually played up to that. And I think that was to my detriment because I wasn't confident enough to say, no, you will take me seriously and I do know my football and I'll show you all. But sometimes I just kind of went along with it for the laugh and took the jokes and kind of played the fall a little bit because that was easier to fit in. And um, I couldn't be bothered to fight, you know, that sort of chest beating about, do you know who won the title in 1981? No, actually, sometimes I don't remember stuff like that. It's not the way I work. I'm, I'm a good writer. I like stories. I like telling stories. I'm interested in football, but I don't have a photographic memory. So I'm not going to get involved in those competitions that to prove that I should be here by reading a top scorer yeah. for the last 10 years. Thank you very much. I mean, Women in Football recently put out a, a new survey. 66% of, of, of members of women said there's experienced some sort of gem, uh, gender discrimination. So I guess what you're telling me horrifically is the last couple of decades, these stories have just been legion. And actually going either for, even further back than that must have been, I guess, even worse. Exactly. And it's, I mean, that survey came out a couple of weeks ago. And I think we were still shocked that it was that the number was that high, because I would say things have changed dramatically. And, you know, because of the work of um, organisations like Women in Football, and because of the, the hard work that us women in the industry have done to bring other women through, um, there are far more of us, we are getting more opportunities, we are showing everybody um, how much better business can be if you have a diverse workforce um so i think when the stat came out we were all a bit like oh it's that bad still um but then you know it's not to say that it's that bad and it's a terrible industry and terrible things are happening i you know the the question was had have suffered discrimination well yeah i would say i suffered discrimination maybe 20 years ago 
but I certainly don't feel like I suffer it now. Never. Um, Everybody takes you completely seriously now, just sees you as a dominant individual in the industry. So from a personal perspective, obviously with those 20 years under your belt and having built up a, a enviable business along the way, because I guess that makes a difference, Joe. I think it does. And I think also it goes back to the point of, I think we felt, well, I certainly felt I had to be better. I had to know more just in case somebody tried to trip me up or just in case they questioned me or the proving yourself point. I think I spent so many years feeling I had to prove myself. And now I prove myself, but I prove myself to me. So the, the only person I'm trying to prove anything to now is myself and my judgment and my responsibilities to myself. But I think previously I felt it to everybody else because I was so worried about what everyone else thought. Do you, do you think there's also a kind of uh, what, what another another cliche is to be a powerful woman in sport? You must be a bit of a ball breaker. Do you see some some people you encounter sort of, you know, quake in your presence or play that card? Oh, I hope not. <laughs> am, I being, am, am I being a am I being a cliche asking that kind of question? No, I think because that's like you say that's sometimes what the the suit of armor that you sometimes have to put on and I think you know I I go through times where I do have to put that suit of armor on there's times where I have to walk in a room and I don't know anybody and I feel maybe a little bit out of place or that I shouldn't possibly be there and oh why have I been why have I been invited here or do I belong here um am I uh what's am I successfully enough to be here should I be in amongst this group and you literally I literally stand outside the door and go Right, put your face on, put your armor on. You've got this, um, and you give yourself that little talking to. So, I don't that's think that's gender specific. Ball breaker, though. That's not gender specific, is it? Let's be honest. We've all, we the, I hope not. one of the lessons for all our students or anybody watching this has to be that there are those moments in life where we have to act as if where it's easier to walk away out the door and go home when you've got to push yourself because you don't know what's going to happen when you get inside that room. Exactly that. And actually, inside that room, there'll be five other people who felt the same when they walked through the door as well. So it's it's OK. And once you're in there, you're all right. Um, but yeah, going back to the ball breaker point, I don't I don't think you have to be a ball breaker. Like, I'm a really nice, quite sensitive, um, very caring person, I would say. I don't think I'm I can be ruthless, but not a ball breaker. I, I feel like you're trying to defend it. And I didn't say you were. I said, had you had to deal with people who perceived that you were, that your power came from being a dominant woman in a what was male industry? That was the point I was trying to make, but, but clearly not very successfully. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's a, good point. We, it's a good point. Before we get into your current business, can we, the leap, to leave the BBC to go with an independent production company. Can you can you take me through your thought process there? Big state corporation, the risks involved, and, and how that all kind of worked out for you. So when I was at the BBC, I didn't even know production companies existed um, because I just grew up and I knew the BBC and ITV and Sky were just coming into business. Um, so I just wanted to work at the BBC and I didn't realise that there were so many opportunities in the industry outside of the BBC. So um, I was working, I'd moved into TV by this point and I was working on Inside Sport, which was um, an amazing uh, weekly sports programme with Gabby Logan, which I loved. Um, and then the 606 programme, obviously the, um, the phone-in show, had been put out to tender and I got a phone call from a company saying, we're pitching for this programme, your name's been given to us as somebody who um, might be good, would, would you be interested in a chat? And I literally, I didn't know how it worked. I didn't know that there would be various companies pitching for a BBC programme. I just assumed the BBC programme was made by the BBC. Um, so I had a, com a conversation. It was a company called Something Else and they they blew me away. They were incredible. Their, their MD, Steve Ackerman, um, was, yeah, like a maverick. Um, and I said, yeah, like, if, if you win the pitch, I, I'm in. And uh, I'd actually gone, I traveled to Kenya, um, Tanzania and Kenya. I was doing some media training for footballers in Africa for the World Service in between series, in between, this is the beauty of the BBC. You can just, and that was so wonderful. Like I started in Britain, obviously yeah. on the website, I moved into radio, I then moved into TV. I then went to teach footballers media skills in Africa for the World Service. You know, that was 
why that's why you join the BBC. It's incredible opportunities. Um, so I'm literally in Kenya and I get a phone call from Steve saying, we've won the pitch. Are you coming? So I was like, well, I better come back from Kenya then. And so I came back and actually by that point, I'd been at the Beeb for, so it was 2009. So I'd been at the Beeb for nearly 10 years. And the Beeb is wonderful, 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 but there's a lot of ceilings. So you could sit and be an assistant producer at the BBC for probably another 10 years. But I just wanted to do stuff. I wanted to um, learn new stuff, to learn everything, to do everything. Um, and that wasn't happening if I was going to do the same job for the next 10 years. So, yeah, it was scary. Um, but I think when you're younger, you you have no fear, don't you? You just, oh, I'll try it. And if it doesn't work out, I'll just get another job. Um, I don't know. You, yeah. you, had, you had, you know, you could, as you say, you could have probably sat there for another 15, 20 years and taken quite a big pension and all the rest of it. So, I mean, when, you, when it comes to big decisions, are you a kind of get the paper out for and against? Are you a, an instinctive person? Instinct, Instinct. always. Yeah. And I'm still the same with most business decisions now. Um, it's always in your tummy. Mm. You know, you know if yeah. it excites you or not. Yeah. And if, if you're that, you've got to be, you've got, there's got to be a little bit of fear. You should always have a little bit of fear, but you know if it feels right. And, and obviously the move to something else did. I mean, how do you, how do you view football phone-ins now? Just as an aside question. I guess it's loaded because um, I, I worry expectations have just got so high from supporters being given this massive voice that it's, contributing to the pressure on football now you know the turnover of managers the turnover of players etc but it was a lovely time like, yeah go on my, i mean most foot most most broadcast output is now a football phone in isn't it yeah. i think actually too much yeah because 606 was so unique yeah when i started there were three times a week so a saturday a sunday and a wednesday night yeah. that you could call up and you were given a platform for 90 minutes. And it was such an exclusive moment and it was so reactive and there was nothing else like it on the radio or the television or YouTube. And now I have, you know, there's fans 24 seven, which is great. Fans have a voice, but like you say, fans have a, a loud, prolonged, consistent um, voice yeah. that actually, I think it's actually possibly been to the detriment of the uniqueness of those programs. And, you know, during my time at 606, we'd, it had always been presented by broadcasters. So trained, skilled journalists, broadcasters. Yeah. And we, we brought in professional footballers. So Robbie Savage became the first footballer. Uh, he was at Derby County at the time. And he was the first footballer to come off the pitch and pop to the um, press box and take phone calls and then Jason Roberts was the first Premier League footballer to do that and that was that was massive that was huge at the time because you have to remember this was a time I used to do a Saturday morning show with Eamon Holmes and we used to spend all week trying to get one footballer to come on on a Saturday morning that's all we needed the big guest at 10 o'clock yeah and it was painful trying to get footballers to talk wasn't it I mean you know like they just they didn't understand the power of um the platform yeah back then whereas now we have three Premier League footballers on one show. Yeah, um, yeah. All trying to have a voice. So it's it was very, very different times. And the move to your own business then, was that sort of seeds that came during the something else period towards the end of the phone-in? Did I, a new idea start to develop or, or, or what sort of spawned the move? No. Do you know what? I'd never, this was never the plan. This was never what I wanted. I actually, I still see myself as, more of a beep girl, like I'm a big company girl. And even at something else, which was a very big um, independent company, I just loved all the people and I loved the away days and I loved walking into an office and there was 90 different people to talk to. Yeah. Um, so this was never part of the plan. And then I just got to a point and it just, it made the most sense. I'd, I'd been doing, um, I built up a small group of um, footballers and ex-footballers um, on the agency side who were, um, signed to the something else agency but I rep them um, so that was yeah it just it just made sense and um, yeah here we are yeah well, later. 
I mean, I tell you what, it's an impressive roster, but it doesn't just include former footballers, former sports people. You've got a lot of top current broadcasters as well. So was that a conscious decision? Um, it's really weird because I've never approached a client. So all my clients have come to me. Okay. Um, so you could say, well, that's crazy business-wise because what's your business strategy? But there is a business strategy because we turn, you know, people come to us. We have, pe you know, every week there's more and more people saying, can we join you? So there is a clear business strategy, but I wouldn't have ever said to you, yes, I decided. So we have we have some clear. So as the agency, we have the broadcasters, we have the current footballers and athletes, um, we have the coaches, um, and we have the pundits and the um, the sort of players in the next um, stage of their career. So that to me is a very clear strategy of the four areas of the business and what we're doing. Um, there was also obviously a conscious decision back in 2012, actually, when uh, the women's team were in the GB Olympics and I started moving into women's football, which again, I didn't grow up with women's football. I grew up, as you know, working on men's football. But it seemed to me that women needed somebody to rep them and help them have um, fair representation, fair um, pay, help with contracts, help with navigating the whole commercial space. Yeah. and giving them a platform in broadcast so again yeah it wasn't i didn't go out there and go right i'm going to sign loads of female players i happened to meet any aluka and she said i'd like i'd like to sign with you yeah. and yes my business head went great that's somewhere i want to be so is that one of the lessons you would pass on to the next generation that that it's nice to have a strategy but we've also got to explore and be, be prepared to deviate because genuinely we never know when an encounter, a meeting, a conversation is going to create something else that takes us off at a side issue. So, so long as I suppose you don't spread yourself too thin, Joe. Yeah, obviously, don't be haphazard about it. Know yeah. what you want to be doing. But every single client I have has come from meeting somebody or somebody hearing about me reputationally. Um, and that what you said about being prepared, being prepared to be flexible. So the best case in point of that was during COVID. So football stopped. So my whole business is built on supplying broadcasters, supplying pundits, um, players playing, coaches working, and suddenly everything stopped. Now, I also have a production company. So that again, don't spread, your, don't spread yourself too thinly, but spread the risk. So when Corona happened and we had no, obviously no income on the agency side and we're scrabbling around trying to find sports equipment and gym equipment for our players to train from home, um, we, we got commissioned a 20 part series on the production side. So the business can keep going. Um, and that to me is like you say, we have no strategy and I wouldn't ever sit here and go, yeah, I've got a really clear strategy. But I do know in my head what I'm doing um and there is a very clear plan for me in terms of people say and i remember when i started some like well quite a few people said you can't do it all you can't run an agency and a production company i was like of course i can it's the sports industry i'll never spread myself too thinly i will never not be attentive to my clients and do my job for my clients and i will never put my name to a production that i'm not happy with yeah and it's also the old, what, what's the old matrix? Uh, existing products to existing markets, new products to existing markets. There's two more, isn't there? And I'm not clever enough to remember. I know, but yes, the, but, I'm, sure there is, there, but, I'm sure there is business theory behind this. Yeah, but there's. But what I'm saying is a lot of your stuff's intertwined anyway, because if, if you've got exposure to broadcasters, then you might want to offer them some content. And if you're supplying ex-sports people as pundits it's logical to offer them potential presenters and reporters as well etc precisely it all intertwines so you know i'll have a meeting about one thing but obviously i'm talking about 20 things and that's where your brain can get a bit exhausted because you're like did i cover that did i do that did i drop that in did i need did i mention that and that's again where the prep happens so i've got the meeting on the pre on the pretense or the look let's have a meeting to discuss x but within that meeting, I know full well, I also need to mention five other things. Otherwise, I'm wasting the opportunity to get in front of some, you know, some decision makers. Do you mind if we talk about the art of negotiation? 
with you being an agent because that's a mm -hmm. big leap from writing football reports to sitting face to face with somebody. I mean, how often does it become hard negotiating and having to back off and potentially walk away? And how much does it come down to soft skills and just gently feeling your way through getting your client the best deal? Um, I think it's something you learn over time and you learn to have confidence with. So it's something I've certainly, like now I don't even think about it. It's just, I go almost into negotiation mode and it's start with this, do this, do this, do this, go back with this, say this, don't do that, hold back, blah, blah, blah. But I think that takes a lot of confidence and a lot of holding your nerve. And also I always know the bottom line of what I'm prepared to do it for. So the, your worst fear is that you're going to lose the deal if yeah. you really want the deal. Yeah. If you don't want the deal, it doesn't matter. You just you can throw some figures out and you can kind of be a bit more flippant about it. But if your client wants that work or that job or that contract and you want it, you do, you just have to know what you're prepared to accept and what you're not. And if you start from that, it's, it, again, it goes back to, right, what's happening on your Friday? Plan your week backwards. Um, how are you building up and how are you going to make sure you've got your energy for Friday? It's the same for me with negotiation. What's my baseline that I'm prepared to go down to? And after that, I'm out. Um, so yeah, it is the other thing I think with me is I'm very honest, I'm very straight. So I've had people say to me in the past, I've really enjoyed negotiating with you because you're quite straight. Like I don't muck about. So if it's something that I want to make happen, I will say quite openly, I really want to make this happen to work with me, but these are my parameters or these are my things. Um, so I would I think I'm I'm quite conscious. I always make it known if I really do want to make this happen and I don't want to say, look, we, you can name a figure and we'll make it happen. But I want to, what I want to say is we want to work with you. So let's both work really hard to get to a point that we're both happy with. And I say the other thing that, yes, it, it was a big jump to go from writing football reports and producing programs to this. But actually, it was the, I don't understand why more people don't do it because I've been the producer. I run budgets. I've got a production company. I can honestly, so when a, a TV company or even a football club come to me, and say, well, this is, you know, this is within, this is our budget, or this is what we're thinking. I can say to them, look, I run budgets too. I know how budgets work. I know what your your bottom line is. I know what your profit line will be. Talk to me honestly about where we can, and I know the lines in your budget. So I'll 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 start suggesting things. I'll go, well, why don't you pull some money in from, I don't know, the 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 researcher day, and they can they can write some questions. So I'll say, are they prepping the interview? Right. Well, let's pull a line in from the researcher line. And I think sometimes that helps me because they understand I'm not just being the agent going, let me get all the money I can. I'm saying, look, if there's money in the budget, let's let's make the budget work for my client. You see, I think a lot of students watching this will aspire to be an agent. You obviously are an FA intermediary. If I got that's yeah, correct. Okay. Yeah. Is, I mean, is that a base skill that they should all do or, or are there any other sort of courses or people that you've studied or books that you've read that you would recommend to aspiring agents? Um, I would love to have actually done a course. I was really lucky. So when I was at something else, I basically was popped next to the agency. So they had an entertainment agency yeah. and just by luck. And Steve Ackerman was kind of like, yeah, I think you'll do well to sit with them just for like literally character purposes. Yeah. So I sat next to Grant Michaels and Sarah Jane Cass and Rich Howes. And um, I just listened and learned. So I, I did have an apprentice, but I was never formally taught. So, you know, there's lots to be said for listening and learning on the job. But I would have I'd love to have done some theory. Um, but it was kind of it was too late for that. I was doing it and actually doing OK as it. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I read, I read everything. I, I read stuff all the time. I think you can't read enough. Um, but I would, I just going back to that, and you, you know, you said, well, lots of the students will want to be agents. I always say to people, but why? Because being an agent is, it's so hard. I can't tell you how hard it is. If you take your job seriously as an agent, it's the hardest thing in the world because I'm responsible for their careers. So decisions or advice I am giving them. They are listening to me as, okay, they don't have to listen to it, but you'd hope that if they're trusting you to be their agent, they're going to listen to what you say. And they're, they're trusting me to speak on their behalf in meetings, to negotiate on their behalf with their best interests at heart, not my best interests, not the person I'm negotiating with best interests, but my client's best interests. And ultimately, I'm planning their career. 
So when they come to me, I'm, I'm not good. I don't want to have a client for one or two years. I want to have a client for the length of their career. And that's a massive responsibility. So I, I do understand that people go, oh, the glamour of it. You know, they see the, the, the big, the big money deals. So few of those deals will happen to you. Yeah, you might get lucky and you'll do one great deal in your life and you'll have a lovely year and you'll buy a car or a holiday or whatever you'll do. But what you have to understand and you have to really question yourself is, do I have the temperament for it? Do I have the patience for it? Do I care enough about somebody else rather than myself to do it? So I would think very, very, very carefully. And the, I mean, the other thing is it's such a crowded market at the moment. There are agents everywhere. We had the, um, the Agents Association ADM a couple of weeks ago. And I can't remember how many people, I mean, there was about 100 agents in the meeting. But I think there's some, I don't know, I don't want to throw figures out, but it's such a crowded market that what are you doing with the rest of your time? You know, what are you going to do if your one player doesn't make it? It's a lot of pressure on your player if you've only got, or what agents do is sign 40 players and yeah. pray that one of them makes it. But what about the other 39? What have you done for them? What about their careers? Yeah. And that's, that's the responsibility. How good's your radar, particularly with the ones that are coming through that maybe don't have a past pedigree? but you might see something they've done on a minor level and think I could make something happen having studied them. How good your radar of getting people through and, you know, um, what you feel comes true? I like to think it's good. And if it's not good, I ask. So I, again, I, as I said to you, I, I go on instinct. So I get an instinct and I'll either see a player and go, oh, I like them. Or I'll meet a person and think, oh, I like you. Right, let me check out what you like on the pitch so whichever way it happens first you do the research on the other side um always meet the families always meet the families and then do your research so i'm not if especially if it's a young player i'm not coaching them every day i'm not training them every day so that's where you've got to have your network to be able to speak to other agents other clubs other coaches even opposition clubs you might have played against them what do you think about this person would you i often ask the managers because I have good relationships with managers, so I'll often give them a call and say, I've been approached by this person, what do you think? Are they, you know, am I, can I be good for them? Can they be good for me? Are they a bit of me? I always go, are they a bit of me? As in, are they a decent human? <laughs> is, well, no, uh, that's, that's, really, line. that's really important, isn't it? I mean, it's it nice to me. work with nice people whose principles and values and beliefs are aligned to your own. There's no point in dragging in opposite directions, Joe. I couldn't do it. I couldn't because we speak to our clients so much that you they do. Um, they are your family, um, and I like we care for them. So I care about their careers. And how can I care for someone I don't like? So yeah, it's really really important to me. And just just morals and values. Um, again, it's about that whole directional thing. Where do you want to get to, and how are we going to get you there? I'm not get rich quick. I'm not going to get you rich quit tomorrow that's not what i'm here for i'm here to look after you to make sure you're fairly represented and to give you longevity of a career i want to i want to finish with two or three quick fires i want please will you tell us maybe about one of your major blockages or you know moments in your career that didn't go according to plan and and how you got yourself out of the fix that you were in sorry if that's putting you on Ooh. the spot uh that's a great question i've had loads um, I'm just trying to think of one that would. You don't have to go into. You don't have to name names and go. But just, I mean, I'm obviously interested in the mechanics of, of what your thought process was and how you got yourself out of that situation. Uh, note to self: warn the guests in future if you're going to spring a question. Like <laughs> no, that. I love it. I love it. It's just it's um, so blockages, blockages. Well, blockages. I would say people that make an assumption about you when they don't know you. Um, so I might say they treated me unfairly because they might not have liked my style or they might not have liked. So then there's a lack of opportunity. Now, it might just have been that they didn't think I was very good. Who knows? But I would say that I, as a young person, I didn't react well to that. I would get quite angry and maybe sometimes rather than just getting my head down and just taking it, I could probably be quite, um, it was a defense mechanism. So I could be 
whether it was moody or quite like, okay, whatever, you know. Um, what I should have done in hindsight is got my head down and just done my job and hope that somebody else would give me an opportunity. But I think I can I can get quite defensive if somebody treats me bad, uh, treats me in a way I feel is unfair. So yeah. If someone's unfair to me and people are always unfair to you, life yeah. is unfair. So yeah. things that are unfair, you know, I lose, I lose, you know, lose contracts for clients now or someone else gets a job for a client that I think my client should have got. And it's really unfair because I think my client would have been the best person for the job. But now rather than I think previously I'd have got really quite angry about it or quite moody about it and maybe been a bit, I don't know if I would have been rude. I hope I wouldn't have been, but I might have been less than kind. Whereas now what I try and do is accept a decision. Okay, I can't affect that now that's been done. How am I going to make sure that that doesn't happen the next time? I get you. So it's coming back to the old adage of we can't control the world, but we can control our reaction to it. Yeah. And of course, instinctive is we will get upset. We will get hurt. None of us like rejection, whether it's for you or my, or my clients or my business or whatever it is. But what I've learned is that happens daily now. That is business. And you have to become a little bit tougher to it rather than getting angry. OK, if you think the last question was tough, here's an even tougher one. In a nutshell, a sentence or a couple of sentences to describe the essence of you or why you are good at what you do. What is your what is the core thing you do that has brought you success? Work hard. That's the only thing. I work so hard and I think sometimes I think people don't realise it because like go, even going back to me playing the fool when I was quite happy playing the fool and going, yeah, I'm the secretary. Yeah, ha, ha, I'm here for a laugh. I think I'm, I kind of, all the fun and I'm all the hands and the fun and the lively here, but underneath, I work constantly. I don't switch off. Like I said to you, when I was trying to make it, I worked seven days a week. I still work seven days a week. I love what I do. I'm at football. I'm watching football. I'm talking to clients about football, but you don't switch off. So yeah, I would say hard work is, is the well, one thing. Well, yes, but let me pay you this compliment. I would, I would say the sheer force of your personality has been a big, part of your success as well surely you don't I mean energy surely and passion is so important and you know there's a proportion of people that our students are going to encounter in their working lives that just don't show enough of it there's, there's something very invigorating about being around a, an energizing person and that's so important when people when you're meeting somebody new don't don't assume it's a given that they know your passion for football don't assume it's a given that they know your passion for business or they know your passion for why you want to do something. You have to show that. And it can be, sometimes it makes you feel quite vulnerable to show how much you care about something or how much you want something. But it it will it will make someone be convinced by you. So if someone's coming to me for a job or just even, do you know the best thing that happens? When people email me and people email all the time for work experience or a job or help or can I have a chat to you? The best thing they can do is say, I watched this or I saw this that your client did or, or I've seen what Tongue Tide did or I saw what Women in Football did or I saw what I see what you do with the Jason Roberts Foundation or the Michael Cope Foundation and I love it because. And immediately you go, oh, you know your stuff. You're passionate. You care about this. You're not just going, I want to be an agent. I want to work in football. Oh, let's email Tongue Tide and hope there's a job. It's that show me the passion. Show me that you do this. You do this regardless of whether I give you a job or not. You're just interested in the industry or interested in football. When we did, um, when I used to um, do applications for 606 or for jobs on 606, we always do it. We did a little football test. But one of the main questions were, who, what football do you go to? Why do you want a job on football if you don't go to football? How can you work on a football phone in fan if you're on a, a football phone in show for fans if you're not a football fan? Yeah. Or you purport to be a football fan. Yeah. So, yeah, show me that passion. Okay. You've made a rod for your own back because my final question is your number one piece of advice, but you've already gone on <laughs> you. work hard. So, so I've got to do another one. Really, you're going to have to have another, you're going to have to have another one. Come on. What oh, is, that's fine. I can do that. Go on um, then. Number one piece of advice. Uh, do you know what I think? Network, actually. So, yeah. look, it's a given, right? Everyone... 
you need to know your stuff. I'm not even going to say my number one piece of advice is not know your stuff. You should know your stuff. If you're serious about um, being in the industry, that to me is an absolute given. Live it, breathe it, read it. Read, 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 read. So many people come to me, they don't read a newspaper. Do you know, even if it's online, they don't read the resource that is there for them. There's so much information in the weekend papers. Just sit there and indulge for half an hour. So it's a given you should know your stuff, so I'm not going to um, lecture about that. So on top of that, just network. Because I've met so many people. I met people 20 years ago that will phone me now and go, do you remember we did this, blah, 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 blah. Well, I've got this opportunity now. Or you never, never know. And don't network to get something from someone. Just network to meet interesting people. Yes. Interesting people, are just they'll make you think in a different way. Don't go into a room thinking, what can I get from all these people? Go into a room thinking, what can I learn about these people? Who can I watch or who can I listen to that might just tell me something different? Or literally, someone might tell me a good television program to watch or a new podcast yeah. to listen to. It doesn't always have to be something that's going to benefit you immediately or directly. It might just make me think differently about the world. Jill, it's, it's a fantastic piece of advice to finish. And just looking at some of the bits I've written down in the time we spent together, writer, radio and television, you know, helping people with their media skills, producer, agent. I mean, that's a heck of a lot to have got through, isn't it? Listen, it's been an absolute pleasure. And you know what? Just to reiterate that networking point, We've probably gone years on end where we haven't spoken. And then you just you just yeah. kind of pick up and stuff happens. I bump into you at some function or just just some small thing happens. But on that, and the, not to embarrass you, but you were you did always give me the time of day. So you mentioned the going around the ninety two grounds, and I think I was tasked with writing it up <laughs> and or, or doing something. And I had to. Ha I wanted a photo of every ground, didn't I? Yeah. But, you were never rude to me. You always accepted I was just doing my job and I'd been tasked with something. So, yeah, I know we, you know, we we might have gone years without speaking in between. But then when you do contact, when you do get in contact, I remember everybody who was kind to me or gave me the time of day or respected me. So of course you pick up the phone to them. It's how it works. And that's what I'm saying about don't don't always expect something from someone immediately. Don't go into anything thinking, what am I getting out of this? Just go into something thinking, oh, that was nice. They were nice to me. What a nice guy. Yeah, yeah. Jo actually reciprocated during the 92 Club because I had to visit her beloved Spurs and I wasn't allowed to go to the old White Hart Lane without meeting her and her mates in Of course. The that was an experience, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. What you Proper Jill, football, um, Clem. <laughs> of course. What an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for sharing. Oh, it's been lovely to catch up with you. I'm Mark Clement. Thanks for watching. Hope you'll join us again soon for another from our Global Insight series. <laughs>